This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good afternoon. I'm Wade Clark Roof, director of the Walter H. Capp Center for the Study of Ethics, Religion, and Public Life, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this very special event. The Capp Center is committed to advancing conversation on ethics in the classroom, in lectures, in our public outreach generally. And a very prominent part of this programming is the course on ethics, enterprise, and leadership that Henry Schimberg established in our center some eight years ago. Henry's influence was considerable, not just in his vision for this course, but in helping us to shape our center's work more broadly. Today we remember and honor his legacy with a program focusing upon ethics in the modern corporation, a topic about which he was particularly concerned. To tell you more about Henry Schimberg, the man and the vision, and about today's program and participants, I call upon David Marshall, the Michael Douglas Dean of Humanities and Fine Arts here at UCSB, Dean Marshall. I'm so glad to see all of you today. And I just have just a very brief word of, of welcome uh, and acknowledgement, really, uh, about this event. Um, what you're here for today is an informal, but I'm sure extremely uh, interesting discussion uh, with uh, J. Alexander Douglas, Sandy Douglas, and I'm going to let Lori Harris introduce him more, more fully. Um, and this really is a kind of a postscript, a kind of spin-off from the course that Clark Roof uh, just mentioned, which is really the heart of the endowment that, that Henry Schimberg um, set up. But we wanted to have this opportunity to do something a bit more public and that could reach to uh, more students uh, than we normally have an opportunity to because the course is, uh, is limited. Um, Henry Schimberg um, told me the first time I met him uh, about his senior essay. And uh, I don't know if you'd be surprised by this or not. It's not surprising to me. But this very important, very, very successful businessman who uh, had a very important leadership uh, role with, with Coca-Cola, uh, was really internationally known in, in business and, and marketing, uh, was an English major. Um, and he was very proud of the fact that he was an English major. And he told me when I first met him that he had written a senior essay on the topic of the hero in American literature. Um, and he always came back to that. He always told me about it. He was very proud of it. And I think that he understood um, that that background he had um, was one of the more important parts of his formation um, uh, as a business leader. Uh, now, of course, he worked his way up uh, through uh, uh, the ranks, starting a a as a driver in, in a bottling uh, uh, company. But um, he understood uh, that to be successful in business, that you had to have a strong liberal arts background. And he was particularly concerned with the problem of ethics. And he came to us and he met uh, Clark, thanks to his wife, uh, Marjorie Layden Schimberg, who's here with us today and has been a great supporter. Um, and he said that he wanted to do something with the university because he felt that students needed to um, learn about leadership and learn about ethics um, by having a firm foundation in the liberal arts, but also 
being introduced to what we do in a university like this, which is to learn how to think critically, to learn how to communicate, to learn how to argue, to learn how to see all the different sides of an issue. Um, business ethics, he felt, had, was being reduced to a kind of uh, um, how to stay out of jail uh, uh, course in, in some business schools. And he wanted students to develop what he saw as an ethical sensibility so that they would be able to recognize ethical problems when they saw them. Not that they would know what the answer was, but they would know how to ask the questions, they would know how to consider the pros and cons, and to think their way out the best that they could of any particular dilemma like that. So it was a really important vision, a vision that really was at the core of our university and at the core of the CAP Center, which really tries to bring to the public important discussions and debates about ethics and religion and public life. Uh, and um, we have many public humanities programs. We sponsor very prominent speakers who come often downtown, bring the public to campus, bring the campus to the public. But this vision was really the first thing that the CAP Center did that was focused on students and on a course. We often have speakers go visit classes and meet students, but this was to really try to do something curricular, and it's a nucleus of what I hope can grow into, uh, uh, into something even more. And from the beginning, Lori Harris um, was involved in developing what this course could be. And Henry Schimberg was very involved in it, uh, was a partner, he, he attended, uh, and um, he and Lori would have, I know, many great uh, dialogues and I'm sure debates and arguments uh, about what should be uh, in the course. And he really took a great personal uh, investment, uh, had a great personal investment. And, and Lori, uh, to her credit, uh, really has uh, put enormous energy and, but even more than that, I think, imagination into thinking about what the course should be. So having Sandy Douglas here today is the type of thing that we love to do in the course, and it's great to have an opportunity to reach a somewhat wider audience uh, and to give you a, a kind of sense of, uh, of what this is about. Um, so um, I'm going to turn it over to Lori to say a little bit more uh, about our guest and about um, uh, really, well, just to begin the discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you, Clark. I am mic'd from here, so I don't think I need to go over there, right? Right? <laughs> OK, thank you. All right, so I'm very delighted to welcome all of you again to be here today for this presentation and to join us in welcoming Jay Alexander, Sandy Douglas, of the Coca-Cola Company. Uh, it is a remarkable gesture in support of teaching ethics to undergraduates that you came out here today for this program. Sandy, as you know, came specifically from Atlanta to meet with our course, Religious Studies 154, Ethics, Enterprise, and Leadership, and to have this conversation about current issues in business ethics with us. When I asked him about coming, he did not say, you know, will you have good weather? And we're very lucky that, that you didn't because we are, <laughs> we are not having our normal Santa Barbara sunshine. Um, but when I asked him, there was really no hesitation. Sandy said, yes. He is here to take the place in our class curriculum in the fifth week of class of his good friend and colleague, the late Henry Schimberg. And as David said, uh, Henry was, of course, very, very involved in, in this course and in the, devel the development of this course. Henry passed away very unexpectedly last June. As you may know, Henry served as CEO and president of Coca-Cola Enterprises Incorporated, the largest bottling company in the world. In, he retired in 2000. In his life after Coke, Henry continued to worry about Coke's market share. But he also became more worried about excessive compensation for business executives, particularly high-level corporate executives. He became more worried about the rapacious conduct of uh, big business. And he started to worry even more about the very low level of training in ethics at most business schools, and certainly in undergraduate curriculums. So um, as a result of this, 
he decided to make a gift to the CAP Center with the goal of teaching ethics to undergraduates, which is what we are doing here uh, today and which is part of this program. It was Henry's wish that our class would instill an ethical awareness and a drive for ethical leadership in undergraduates in you. When you leave the university, we want you to have this ethical awareness. We want you to have this ethical compass. We hope, uh, we hope that you will. Um, with the support and encouragement of Henry's wife, Marjorie Leyden Schimberg, the class is going forward and we are moving forward with Henry's vision. Our guest today, Sandy Douglas, is no stranger to the way that Henry worked. Sandy and Henry worked together at Coca-Cola for many years, and um, that is Sandy, Henry was an important mentor uh, to Sandy at Coke. Sandy joined Coca-Cola, this Fortune 100 company, with its iconic logo in 1988 as a district sales manager. He rose rapidly to become vice president of Coca-Cola USA in 1994, and then in 1998 his responsibilities were increased to include all of North America. He be became president of the North America Retail Division in 2000. In 2003, he was appointed senior vice president and chief customer officer, and today he is the global chief customer officer of the Coca-Cola company, one of the most recognized, important, and controversial brands in the world. This program today might be thought of as the first annual Henry A. Schimberg Memorial Lecture, even though it's not a lecture, it's a conversation, a discussion in which I hope you will be involved, but certainly the first of many such programs that we hope we will have. Um, Sandy and I will begin with a conversation and then open the floor to your questions, and there will be some coming around with a microphone if you have questions uh, later on. So please join me in welcoming Sandy Douglas here today. All right, so this is a pleasure to have this conversation. And the first two questions that I have, really, number one, titles in corporate America are very difficult uh, and sometimes confusing. Can you please tell us exactly what do you do as global chief customer officer for the Coca-Cola company? Yeah, thank you. What's your um, job? I, my job is to be the champion cheerleader for salespeople inside the Coca-Cola business around the world. Like whether that's our, <clears throat> our largest customer relationships, uh, our company associates or Baller associates who are involved in selling Coca-Cola around the world. Uh, before I did this, I was president of the North America Group for six years, and before that, I was chief customer officer. So this is a return back to the, the primary function of my career, which has been sales. And you do a lot of traveling, right? I do. I do. We, uh, we operate our business in 207 countries. Only two uh, where we don't operate is North Korea and Cuba. But we, uh, uh, so we, we, we have, uh, we have 800,000 teammates around the world. And most of them are in sales. And so I get to cheer for them and, and travel around the world and, and walk around the marketplace with them. Interesting. It's an interesting job, right? It sounds, it sounds very interesting. You were able to closely observe Henry at Coke and to see his management styles, his techniques, his attitudes. Can you share with us any lesson you might have learned from Henry or any anecdote that comes to your mind uh, about him as we're starting this conversation today? Well, you told me just a second ago you were going to ask me this. Um, yes. Part of my bio was that I was made a vice president in 1994, and the, the reason for becoming one was that I was to call on Henry Schimber as the leader of Coca Cola Enterprises, which was our largest bottler. Um, and I remember walking into his office, and I'd seen him before, uh, and I was 33 years old, which sounds old to most of you, uh, but it wasn't that old at the time. and, and Henry was very intimidating, and he, and he said so. He said, I, I played a role in approving you getting in this job. And I said, thank you, sir, very much. I'm very grateful. And I was. Um, but he said, you know, frankly, I believe this business is not learned in offices like these. And he said, I have 33 divisions in the United States. And I want you to go to every single one of them and work with the, 
people in the division in the marketplace for at least a day. And between the time that uh, you complete that task and today, I have no real need <laughs> to meet with you <laughs> because I won't view you as even qualified until you've met all the people that work for me. And um, I remember I said I would do it, of course, as fast as I possibly could. And I left his office and I thought that's an extraordinary thing to ask somebody to do. I mean, I'm paid to call on you. I, I can't call on you until I've been to 33 divisions. <laughs> but what, what happened as a result of that is, is that activity, which was totally unprecedented, nobody from the so-called parent company, the franchisor, ever did that. But I did, I went to all 33 of them. And that bought me credibility with his people which he knew I would need more than anything else to be successful in my job. And so it began a mentoring relationship that was significant. Uh, and Henry Schimberg was by far the most important mentor in my career. And so when I was asked to come out here and participate in this, um, immediately and as often as I'm asked. Wow, thank you. Thank you. We will, we will be glad to take you up on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank well, I know that could get to be dangerous, but, <laughs> but, but I, the qualification is as often as I'm asked, so you guys have something to say about that. So. Yeah, we'll talk later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. That's a wonderful offer. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I want to know, as kind of a basis for this conversation, what do you think it means to be an ethically responsible business person? And I ask that in this way. You know, you have many different ethical responsibilities. You have a lot of stakeholders, this audience, for you, your consumers, um, your so many uh, subcontractors. But you also have fiduciary duties to the corporation and to your stockholders. So how do you balance these? How do you prioritize them and, and work with them? Well, and, and apologies somewhat to the, to the class, because we covered some of this before. But um, let, let me, the, the simplest answer to that is an ethical business person is someone who's involved in an ethical business. And an ethical business, in, for, and I'm just giving you my own point of view, is, yeah. is a business that does something useful, does it in a sustainable way, and sustainable meaning environmentally, socially, and financially sustainable. And in today's era, and I know I'll come back to this because it's a topic that interests me a lot, but is fully uh, transparent. Um, and a leader that is, is committed to that kind of a business and helping it prosper against the multiple stakeholders that would have uh, interests be they financial, environmental, social, um, I think is, a, is per, a person who's at least in the right pursuit. Uh, and then the test of time is whether or not you stand up to the challenges of meeting a triple bottom line, of being, of being transparent and continue, continuing to be a business that's useful. Because a failure of any of those uh, ultimately would result in a failure of the business. So thank you. So I want to ask a little bit. We talked in our class for a few moments about the public health issues that are associated with the consumption of Coca-Cola. And I just want to put it more specifically as part of this conversation for everyone to, uh, to have an opinion or to, or to know your opinion about. Because we've all heard about the New York you know, Mayor Michael Bloomberg's ban on large size servings of sugary uh, or sweetened, uh, sugar sweetened beverages. Now, Coke, as a member of the American Beverage Association, was a party to the lawsuit that successfully stopped this ban from taking effect and left Michael, Mayor Bloomberg stymied because the courts have said yes, that he can't impose this ban. Um, how do you navigate 
the public concerns about the risks of obesity and diabetes, caused, you know, which may be caused from consuming Coke or other beverages, with your mission to expand your sales and grow your business? Well, let, let's unpack it uh, in, a, in a, I think, a fully transparent way. Um, as I said in the class, obesity is a significant and complicated health issue. Um, for the first time in, in human history, there are more overnourished people than there are undernourished people. And that's the undernourished going down is a good thing, obviously. Uh, but it's a complicated problem, and it's a, it's a real problem. And as a company that sells beverages, some of them with sugar and calories in them, we, we have to show up on this issue. We can't uh, try to hide or manage messages or in some way demonstrate a lack of sensitivity and care. Um, and having said that, I think you know, part of what the Coca-Cola company is committed and actually acting upon uh, and has been acting upon is, is helping contribute to the conversation that helps everybody understand the issue. Because it's natural. I mean, we, we want to try to blame. So we, we always, when we see a complicated problem that's a serious problem, we want to we wanna assign blame. We want to try to simplify it. But this is a subject that doesn't lend itself very easily to simplicity. Um, obesity or weight gain, overweight, happens when you consume more calories than you burn. Uh, and that understanding is critical to the solution. Uh, and, and in that sense, you have to understand calories. And, and what the company is doing is lending its voice, its considerable marketing muscle, its considerable uh, just amount of conversation investment to helping consumers better understand it. So what are we doing? We're, we're innovating. Um, you know, in 1981, one percent of our cola business was zero calories. It was a product called Tab, uh, not because we necessarily had so much vision, but our customers wanted a diet soft drink, so we created Diet Coke. Uh, diet Coke was an incredibly fast-growing part of our portfolio, but it wasn't hitting all the segments, so we created Coke Zero, which tastes more like Coke. Today, 44% of our cola business in the United States is zero calories. Well, why were you opposed to Mayor Bloomberg's limitation on the large size servings of Coca-Cola or well, other beverages? Well, let, let me start by saying what we're not opposed to. We, we think Mayor Bloomberg, first of all, is a, was an, and is still a very talented mayor. And his concern about public health is well placed. Uh, my boss, Mutar Kent, and Mayor Bloomberg are very close collaborating uh, people on many issues. I mean, Hurricane Sandy came through New York, and there were Coke trucks all over lower Manhattan giving away water. And Mayor Bloomberg and, and Mutar Kent are on each other's cell phones. We don't agree with the mayor on this particular item because it takes one thing. I mean, there are a lot of things that have calories in them that are fun for you kind of things. And to take one item and the way that the regulation was created, discriminate against certain kinds of retail outlets and not others, to pick on non-alcoholic beverages and not alcoholic beverages, and I could go on, was an inefficient way of attacking the problem. What, and, and would ultimately consequate a product and certain retail stores in a way that wouldn't elevate understanding of the issue and real solutions. So we, we have an ongoing debate with the mayor about what the best way is to attack this solution. But as you've seen us announce with Rahm Emanuel in Chicago and with uh, Mayor Castro in San Antonio, we, we've got comprehensive programs we want to do as a partner with government and civil society. And we think when all of food and beverage and the government and civil society come together, we can raise up understanding. We can put calorie information on the front of products. We can innovate. And ultimately, what we've seen factually 
is that begin to make a difference against the broader public health issue rather than just pick on a particular item or a product that ultimately wouldn't change the outcome. Thank you. And, and let me say one more thing. Obviously, you expect me to say that because I sell Coca-Cola. Uh, but but w what, what I hope you hear is conviction. Uh, we're not saying, and I didn't say in any case, that there was bad intention or not a real issue here. What I said is that I think, whether it's soft drinks or ice cream or french fries or whatever it is, I mean, we all have our vices. Uh, the, the key is to understand the dynamics of healthy weight and then to have products and options and choices and programs and investments in public health and active living, which we have across the country through boys and girls clubs, that create the opportunity for people to have a healthy weight. And at the Coca-Cola company, we are, like anything else that has calories, part of calories in, we're gonna promote understanding, choice, innovation, and activity so that people can be healthy. That, in the end, serves our business. Great. Thank you for, thank you for elaborating. Um, there was an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal last week. Some of, some of you may have seen it, talking about changes in uh, Coke's board of directors. And Coca-Cola's board of directors is particularly influential in the way you operate your business. I was interested to see that your two oldest directors, who are 86 and 80, have each said that they will uh, not stand for re-election for another term, but leave the board when their term expires. Um, so I know you've been planning for this transition to new and younger board members. The average age of your board members is a lot higher than most other Fortune 500 companies. So what kind of changes do you expect from a newer or younger board going forward? What do you imagine uh, might, um, what direction do you think that they are going to want to go in, if you know? Well, I, I don't. What I can say is that my experience with the Coca-Cola Company's board of directors is a, one of high accountability uh, a as, a, as a manager. Um, when you walk around a board table and you turn around and you see the likes of Warren Buffett or Sam Nunn or Don McHenry or Peter Uberoth and they represent your owners and they're asking you questions that test your thinking, your values, your transparency. Uh, Alexis Herman I mean, these are these directors are people of substance, and uh, I believe that our company's track record is, in large part, a credit to their counsel and the discipline that they put into the company. And I expect the current set of directors and the new directors to continue to be increasingly diverse increasingly broad-based in their experience, but certainly no less challenging. And for those of us in management, we'll continue to be very accountable. Excellent. <laughs> Given the wage gap and the different in, difference in numbers between men and women working at Fortune 100 companies, interested in knowing where would you put um, Coke, either Coke um, USA or Coke North America in terms of gender balance in your upper level staff? Yeah, I, um, I don't have hard metrics on this. What I can speak to you about is uh, recognition externally and then I can talk about strategy and then ultimately execution. I mean, Coke just got the Catalyst Award this year for its total focus, marketplace and workplace, in terms of women's development. And, 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 and I, I talk about this, and my boss, Mutar Kent, has pioneered the five by uh, 2020, which is five million women empowered worldwide in our business or around our business by 2020. And I, I said this to the class earlier, I, I believe that this century that we're in 
is going to be less about one geography or another and more about the, the commercial realization of women. Um, this, I mean, women are the principal purchasers of our products. They're the majority of graduates of higher education today. And it's our view uh, at the company that whether it's in the workplace or the marketplace, our strategy needs to fully capitalize and promote and uh, encourage all that that uh, building force has to offer. Um, inside Coke USA, uh, the development of a diverse and highly talented workforce is the way we've done business. And as I left the president's job in December, my successor as the head of North American Brands was a woman. The head of the carbonated soft drink brand groups was a woman. The head of the Sprite brand was a woman. The head of the Fanta brand was a woman, is a woman. Um, the newly appointed head of the whole Fountain Sales Organization, which is a third of the US business, is a woman. Uh, the head of commercial operations is a woman. And, and I'm not just in the end of it. The woman who runs HR is a woman and has been. But I went, just ticked off most of the top operating jobs inside of Coke North America, and they happen to be women. And they are the most talented people for each one of those jobs who happen to be women. So, so you're happy with that? I am. I, it, it's making, it gives us competitive advantage, not because they're women, but because they're the most talented people. And because uh, when you fully take advantage of the full talent pool, uh, and, and that's not just gender, but all forms of diversity, um, you end up with the most talented team. And I'm, uh, you know, I, those of you who have read Blink, I mean, there's so many ways of understanding maximizing talent. And for a business that sells drinks worldwide daily for cents at a time, of all the businesses in the world, I think ours needs to reflect the full talent pool. And I'm proud that we're working hard on that goal. All right, well, that is, that is, an, that is an important goal. And I don't know, I don't have the data on um, the number of women currently employed but it's encouraging that the heads of your divisions are women in such prominent positions at Coke. And so that's, that's the thing um, that's important for all of us to hear and then to follow up on. Uh, I have about a dozen questions I could ask you, but I'd like to throw this open for your questions, the questions that you would like to ask uh, Sandy Douglas. And I know there's a handheld mic. Um, if, who has? the handheld mic. Yay. All right. So I think the easiest thing to do is on one side of the room and the other side of the room, if those of you with questions, raise your hands and either Dr. Heck or um, what is it? Brittany. Thank you. We'll come around with the microphone and you have to speak into the microphone. All right. So questions. Hi, thank you for coming. Uh, I am not in the oh, I am not in the uh, class religiously. Uh, 154 is that what you 154, said? 154, yeah. But um, attending this lecture and hearing you talk about ethical companies a little bit, um, I'm wondering what role you feel like an ethical company like you assert that Coca-Cola is. Um, what role you feel like it has? Um, it's in 207 countries worldwide. What role you feel like your company has when? citizens can buy a bottle of Coca-Cola for cheaper and a bottle of water, or what role, I'm sorry, that's very specific, what role you feel like as an ethical company Coca-Cola has for um, like responsibility of citizens that don't have access to those resources, if any role? I'm wondering if you feel like uh, your company has a role in that. Well, thank you for that question. We, we did talk about this in the class. I, there, uh, I talked about the kind of framework for an ethical company being usefulness, sustainability, and transparency, and inside sustainability, environmental, and social. So let me dive into environmental and social. Uh, you know, one of the core issues that Coke needs to step up on, I talked a little bit about obesity. Let me talk about water. 
95% uh, of our ingredients is water. And water is, is a scarce item, and it's going to become increasingly scarce. And so the Coca-Cola company is absolutely stepping up as a leader in water sustainability. And we said that by 2020, we will return 100% of what we use. Uh, and there's a wide range of initiatives going on to achieve that. Today, I think we're somewhere in the 35 to 40% range, but we're on our way. Uh, one of the most interesting initiatives that we're working on now that's just an early stage innovation is called Project Slingshot, which is, uh, it ties with the 5 by 20 um, Women's Empowerment Initiative, but basically it's an innovation that takes water that is not healthy water, it could be as bad as sewage water, and turns it into distilled pure water that could be used for medical uses. And the person who developed the innovation, our innovation partner, is the same person who created the technology for the, uh, the Coke fountain machine that makes 106 different Cokes that you're seeing in some places. And it's microdosing technology. And he was working on water for kidney dialysis. And as he got into it, he started to figure out that he had something that might be more important. And while I don't have these facts exactly in my head, about half of the hospital beds in the world are filled with people who are sick because they can't get drinking water, clean drinking water. And so as Dean Kamen, who's the innovator, started to think about this, and he was working with us on this fountain machine product, he started talking with my boss, Mutar Ken, about what could we do together if we partnered on this, and Mutar jumped on it. Uh, and it's a major initiative now. We're, I think there are 10 of them now, but we have a vision over the next couple of years to have thousands and then tens of thousands. And we're starting to partner with different NGOs who can help propel us around the world. But what a good thing for Coke to be in the middle of, to help attack the issue of clean drinking water as a part of a broader corporate social responsibility goal of returning all of the water that we use. And to, to us, the way I would summarize that is we have to operate a sustainable business. Now, you know, we're, we're the biggest private employer, I think, in, in the continent of Africa, at least we were a couple of years ago. We've been an innovator in, in terms of AIDS benefits for our employees. The, we typically focus on the things that are involved with our business because that, that's natural of a fusion of what our sustainable requirements are and what people would expect us to do. Uh, and, and in the end, we think that's the way you should measure us and the way that most of the people we talk to do measure us. So, let me just say that, Blair, you had a really good question in class after Sandy left. Maybe we could, I could ask you to ask, ask Sandy that question now. Thank you. So basically my question was, um, well, when in the previous class we talked about the importance of the link between businesses and ethical actions and basically um, that by a business not doing the right thing, they can create profit they, because the consumers won't buy a product. So I was wondering before this class, I had no idea that Coca-Cola was involved in a water project and, and various other projects. And so why don't you make that more well known? Why, why did you show us a commercial comparing bombs and, and baking cakes? And it was like a fun and like commercial, but why didn't you, why don't we see more commercials on, with actual facts? And um, that would be really good to know. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's an excellent question. And to be completely honest, we're struggling with that now. We're, we, if you, if you took our global advertising budget and said it's whatever it is, um, historically our philanthropic efforts, our sustainability efforts were, if you go way back in history, they, our values said that should be done behind the scenes. <laughs> that, that should be something you get caught doing if you get caught doing it, but you're doing it because it's right. You're not doing it because you're trying to, to show off. Uh, but that, that was in a different world. 
um, what we talked about for everybody else in the class is a, a core thesis that I have about business is that consumers control businesses. You, you own our brands, or we co-own them at best. And I believe from a standing start, any business that relies on consumer goodwill can put itself out of business pretty fast if they don't adopt the values of consumers. Now, that doesn't mean they give up what they're trying to do, but they have to make what they're trying to do fit the values of the people they're trying to sell, or else I, I think there's just too many other options. And I could, you can look at governments being overthrown, re religious institutions being less to not relevant, but that all of that was born of a, of a set of beliefs, and today's internet and social media turns those things that used to take a while or could be buried or hidden, and it's, it's out of your control as a business, and so your only recourse is to be the business that your customers want you to be, and that that's an economic reality, not a philosophy. I don't think it's a choice, but what, Coke is struggling with now is, all right, given that, we need to start telling people what we're doing. But we also want to be interesting. And part of what's made Coke commercials great over many, many years has been music and positivity and makes you smile. And ironically, if you go back in history and look at Coke commercials, there's a little bit of social progress in a lot of the best commercials we ever run. I mean. And, and most of the people in this room were not in anywhere close to being born when some of these ads yeah. ran. But the I'd like to teach the world to sing Coke ad was a very diverse group of people standing on a hilltop towards the end of the Vietnam War. And we weren't taking a stand on the war, but we were saying we'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony and showed pictures of people of ethnicities from all over the world, men and women. And, and we made our point. Um, when the Mean Joe Green ad ran, I mean, I was a football fan. I didn't see the racial story in that ad. I was a white kid from New York City, and I, I was like any other little boy who tried to ask for an autograph. I knew how utterly terrifying it was. But for a lot of African Americans, the way that that ad set up with a little white boy asking a big black man for the, in a power position for their autograph was a statement that we see you. Uh, and so I'm, I'm not saying that it's not going to change and we're not going to spend more time telling people what we're doing. We're going to do that. And we're certainly going to do it on the web. We're certainly going to do it in Facebook and other places where people are looking for that, our sustainability report. Yeah. But we're also going to continue to try to make things interesting, fun. And I showed you guys the World Cup ad. And that World Cup ad had a lot of social justice in it, even though it looked like a uh, uh, silly, silly sort of Coca-Cola type advertising. But so you'll, you, you'll have to watch us struggle. But your question is right on. Other questions? I think good, and then next. That's okay. Excellent. Um, earlier, you had mentioned that you guys had planned to return the water by 2020. Um, so I'm just curious, how does that operate? Um, so you take the water, and then you take it, and you, guess you make coke out of it. But how do you quantify the? repayment? Is that in water sales of water companies that you're selling them water? Or is it selling them Coke and that's water turned into Coke? Yeah. It, you, you'd have to go to our sustainability report for the details of the calculation. But one, it, one way of understanding it is that if we can set up rain reclamation and end up feeding aquifers or public water supplies, that, that would all count in the calculation. So it, to the extent that our Project Slingshot works, all of that water would count in the calculation. So it's not necessarily the same ounce of water, but it's creating water for water used and having the total equal zero over time. But if you just 
Okay. It, but if you displace water, um, just because you can recollect water from that same area doesn't mean that you're necessarily returning the water to the natural habitat. Well, it, well, what we're saying is if we can contribute the water back into the system that people are using, then effectively we're doing the same thing. Okay. Are you guys making investments in, in those sort of developments? Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the sustainability commitment is to get to zero water by 2020, and the measures are publicly explained in our sustainability report, and we're investing like crazy. And it, I, I answered this earlier, but again, go back to sustainable company is a useful company that's sustainable. We, our success as a business depends on our ability to create and support healthy water supplies. And that's, that's good business for us, but it's also good for the communities that we serve. And being able to measure it is the key to transparency. If it's, if it's a story and not a truth, as I've said a couple different times, won't work. Thank you. Um, so I had a little bit of a question uh, getting back to the um, health issue. Um, it seemed to me that there were the American Beverage Association sort of had uh, two, at least from what you, you sort of said, it seems that there were two types of objections. And the first one was sort of that it discriminates against, you know, our beverage type and, you know, these other outlet types and things like that. And that seems pretty reasonable from my perspective. But I guess I'm concerned about the other one about the efficacy. Um, just from my perspective, it seems like when a beverage association whose role is to, you know, help its businesses sell more beverages starts speaking on matters of epidemiology and policy concerns and effectiveness, it seems like that's kind of already biased. So I guess I'm wondering what role do you think an ethically responsible company has for sort of speaking outside of its own expertise area? Uh, that's an excellent question. I, I I think the the first way I would talk about that is to be transparent about the argument you're making. So there's an inherent bias to a beverage association. That's what it is. It's an association of beverage companies. Um, uh, but the transparency is in the argument you're making. Um, and effectively, what we're saying is, let's join together and attack the problem. Well, let's not you know, take it out of beverages. Let's not pick on ice cream uh, just because ice cream has got lots of calories in it and not a lot of nutritional value, so let's pick on ice cream. Instead, let's, and, and let's stop arguing over discriminatory taxes and the picking off of a couple of sizes, and let's talk about how people in the city of New York can be healthier. And what we've just put in place in Chicago and San Antonio, and we are going to in increasingly more and more cities, is programs where we're putting, hiring uh, troops that are coming back from overseas and putting them through boys and girls clubs to do health and wellness programs for inner city kids. Let's put calories and calorie education and advertising and use some of the athletes and other pop stars and that we've got and have them talk about calorie balance and eating in a healthy way. Let's work with all the retailers who are part of that lawsuit, by the way, who don't like Mayor Bloomberg's regulation either. Let's join together to make sure that there's fresh, affordable food inside the cities of where people are shopping. And, and, and that combination of things will materially impact the health of, of consumers and you can get, I can get you objective third parties who you would view as objective who agree that those are the components. The first lady of the United States when she launched Let's Move laid out the pieces of the plan. The American Beverage Association was there with her day one announcing that we were going to shift calorie count uh, counts to the front of our cans and not per, put per serving so it was so confusing you didn't understand it. And she lauded it 
but she also laid out availability of fresh food, affordability of fresh food, more health and active programs. She entitled her program, Let's Move. And so I'm not coming up with all the programs. We're joining in and we're just saying, let's not discriminate against one part of the Cowrie universe. Let's get in this together. And we differ w with the mayor of New York on how to approach it and we are obviously thinking about ourselves in that respect, but we're not differing with him about his goal. And we've said very respectfully, we think he's an outstanding mayor who cares about his people. We're just implementing programs with borough presidents now to try to really attack the, pro the problem. But our bias is visible and transparent. We, we, we're not trying to hide behind some American Beverage Association is clear what it is. And, and let me ask you, I mean, I'm, I'm in, I'll, I'll answer any other questions you want, but one of the problems with a format like this is when I'm sitting in a room full of 150 or 200 people that have a lot of the answers, and I'm one person, and this is going in an anti-intellectual way. So <laughs> if, if you have an idea for me that you think makes sense, for an ethical corporation, whether you give it to me today or not, um, somehow the school can collect them. I'd love to know your thoughts and ideas. I can assure you that the Coca-Cola company uh, and many companies, because we're accountable to our customers, are gonna be interested in the ideas. Well, that's great. So, so, so before our next question, so if you do have an idea for Coke or a comment, you can, we should forward it. And I think, you know, my email is, is available of Lori Harris through the college. And Sandy, are you on the web? I don't remember. I am. My email is, this is really dangerous, so what I'm about to do. Um, and, and it's not because of everybody in the room. It's, it's the uh, cameras in the room. But um, I, I think, I think. Uh, Where should a comment be sent? I send it to me. To J Douglas, J, like James Douglas, D O U G L A S, uh, at coca cola.com. And I'll ask you to, and everyone who just heard my email, to be respectful that I will read it. Uh, and that means that hopefully you'll be respectful of the fact that I will read it. <laughs> <laughs> Reference this ethics discussion in your subject line. Be ethical, yes. <laughs> I have one more question uh, pertaining to the use of groundwater that we were talking about earlier. Sure. And um, the number had stricken me. You were saying, you know, we want to give back 100% of what we take. And in class, um, you gave us a, a cool picture of a water um, treatment facility that you want to put, I believe it was in Africa, mm -hmm. and it has solar panels on top, and the water is for sale, if I'm correct. That's what it seemed, looked like. Um, they had prices on there, and they also will dispense Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. And so my, my concern was, are you paying for the water you're taking in the first place? Because it doesn't seem very ethical to me to be taking water and then, you know, supposedly giving it 100% back, but you know, for monetary compensation. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair question. The, the kiosk that you saw is a, is a local business. It's not a Coca-Cola company business. And the idea is that if we can take water and clean it up, that it can be returned and used by local communities. Now, the cost is... It'll be whatever the cost is for that entrepreneur to run their business, but it's not our, it's not a profit center for the Coca-Cola company. It's a, there might be Coca-Cola sold in that kiosk. We could, yeah. We we don't. Well, but that's not that's not the purpose of why we're doing that. the The purpose of of the the water innovation is to make a difference against a gigantic problem. What we've never said, and, and I, don't, I, I don't think we would ever say, is that if there's a Coca-Cola to be sold, that we won't try to sell it, or a Diet Coke, or a 
simply juice. Uh, but what we are saying is that we want to try to make a positive difference against a, a core issue that's causing a lot of illness. And the concept slide you saw today envisages a local community person setting up a business in a kiosk where people can plug their phones in and or watch sports events, solar powered, there where they can also get fresh water. Did you pay for the water? That was, that was kind of my main question. Well, the water that we're in, they took in the first place. The water that we're taking in to clean isn't to use for Coca-Cola products. Yeah, we're paying for it virtually everywhere. Okay. Uh, water's not free. Uh, and, and over time, the problem with water scarcity isn't going to be what you get charged for it. It's going to be its availability. So our ability to take unpotable water and turn it into potable water uh, and to invest in the infrastructure that does that uh, is going to be very valuable indeed. But yes, we pay for all the water we use. Do we have time? Do we have time, Clark, for one more question? Hi. So I'm a political science student, and I'm just curious as to your opinion on the role that gun companies should take in the advocacy of mental health awareness and um, product safety with their products, or is there a point where a product becomes too political for um, business ethical involvement in the issue? I, I can't. I have a lot of opinions on that subject, uh, but they're all personal. Um, you know, I, I think, the, and, and I want to jump out of the environment that you just said, because I really don't want to comment on that industry, although I'll talk with you about it privately. But for me, an ethical business is a business that's useful, that is sustainable and transparent. And your argument transparently made, honestly made, uh, has to stand the test of the people who view it and the people who would buy or not buy your products. And uh, I think some arguments are pretty hard to make. Um, but uh, I'm not in that business, and, and I'm in my business for a reason. This has been a very, very good discussion. I'm sorry we don't have more time. To well, I want to express uh, the thanks of all of us for uh, Jay Alexander Douglas and Laurie Harris for this very interesting conversation. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, everybody.